I love you, still love you, God. Though I fail you, I need you so desperately. Okay. So why then are we to seek freedom from inordinate attachments? whole bunch of reasons here. Firstly, they draw our focus away from God. That should be kind of obvious, isn't it? started off being a really healthy friendship, and I just wanted to spend more and more time with that person to the point where I'm excluding prayer. It diverts my attention away from God. I, eat, I overeat. Draws my attention away. Have you ever tried to pray on a really full stomach? Okay. Or I stop wanting to. The guy who's spent too much time studying on his paper can't get up in the morning for prayer. Okay, inordinate attachments divert our desire away from God. This is strong language, but in a sense they, it insults God. Why? What are we doing? We're actually with an inordinate attachment. We're saying to that thing, even if that thing is a person, you're more important than God. And there is nothing. No one more important than God. So it is an insult. God doesn't get angry with us at that, but he gets sad because he knows we're looking for the right thing in the wrong spot. So an inordinate attachment does insult God because we're saying to that thing, you're more important than God, or we're saying to God, that thing's more important than you, by our actions. We probably wouldn't dream of saying, ah, oh, my friend Charlie is more important than you, God. We wouldn't dream of saying that to God, but by our actions, that's what we are saying. When we're inordinately attached to something, joy disappears. Joy evaporates. And funnily enough, we often go after something thinking it will provide something like joy. Yet when we, if we overeat because we're looking for comfort, we're looking for the joy, but paradoxically it disappears. If we want to spend time with that person because they're a great person to be with, paradoxically when we start, when there's an undue attachment to that person, all of a sudden we have to try, we go looking for more time with that person, thinking that that will bring back the joy. But it doesn't. Why? Because we're seeking that thing outside of God's purpose and plan for it. Okay? It actually makes us less than human. An inordinate attachment makes us less than human. Why? Because to be truly human is to be alive with the glory of God. And when we settle for something other than God, we're diminished in our humanity. We're less human, not more so. The other nature of inordinate attachments is they're inexhaustible. You can never have enough time with that friend. There's never enough red jaffers. <coughs> There's never enough of whatever it might be. Desires multiply and multiply here. And so it becomes this quest, this search. And you can see this alive and at work in people and you know it, it's true in yourself. Critically, inordinate attachments block our transformation. It's like they put the brakes on us. They put the brakes on us being genuinely transformed. Why? Because we're not actually allowing God to do the work in us that he wants us to do because our focus is elsewhere, our attention is somewhere else. Okay, so if that's attachment, and maybe a helpful expression here is inordinate attachment, John doesn't use that, it can get a bit misleading. So this is disordered attachments. You're supposed to love your friends. You're supposed to love your family. But it's when we want those things more than we want God that they're disordered, right? So inordinate attachments. If that's what they are, what do we do about them? Agere contra is a Latin expression, which means you do the thing against. Okay, so agere is act. Contra, against, okay? The, the image that I think is really helpful here is if, I'm no gardener, but my understanding is if you've got a tree that because of, say, the wind and the position of, of the tree in the garden, if the tree is growing like this, 
okay, at an angle. To straighten it up, what do you need to do? Well, you put a stake here, don't you? And then you tie a rope around the tree and the stake, and you keep shortening the rope, and you straighten up the tree. That's the principle of a Jeda Contra. So if I have a tendency to eat too much, to act against it is, I don't just eat what I just need, I might deny myself a little bit more. I'm pulling on the rope, yeah? Okay? If I know that I just keep thinking about this person all the time, and it's not an ordered kind of attachment to that person, I'm thinking about them when I should be doing other things, it's distracting me from my real work, what I might do is say, well, you know, for a few weeks, I'm not going to spend some time with that person. And so it can break the attachment, where all of a sudden now I start saying, okay, well, I know when a good time to spend with this person is, but it's not going to get in the way of me doing the other things I need to do to fulfill my role, my vocation in life. Yeah? That's pulling on the rope. Is that making sense? Okay. John of the Cross has a couple of other things to say about how we become attached. Now, this is where he uses some really strong language this is where he's most likely to be misunderstood. So pay attention. If you've fallen asleep at this point, you wake up at this point, that's, this is a point to really, um, you know, the room for misunderstanding here is strong, okay? So let's, let's listen carefully. John says to become detached, that we're to be inclined. Key words. Okay, be inclined to choose what is most difficult, what is harshest, what is unpleasant, what is least, what is lowest, rather than what's easiest or most delightful, gratifying, most, highest, or precious. Now, can you see why that could sound really terrible, really harsh? Now, key, key first point. He says, be inclined. Okay? So he's not saying that you will always have to do that. Okay, when a friend, you're trying to practice detachment, friend says, let's go do something enjoyable. Oh no, that's, um, I need to do something unpleasant until you go off and decide that you're going to do four times the amount of housework that you need to do or something like that. It's not what John's saying. Okay? What John's saying is that if we want to be free of created things, the, test, the, the way to know that we're always going to do that is to be inclined towards the opposite of what seems easiest and most pleasant and lightest and to, choo to be endeavoured to choose those. He's not looking for extremism here. Sometimes when people misunderstand this, this is where the, some of the saints like stop cutting their hair or cutting their nails and doing those sorts of things. That's an early understanding and a misunderstanding of what's going on here. Okay? What John's getting at is really it's the principle of act against again. If you know that you're attached to something, do the opposite. And just go that bit further. Okay, just go that bit further. Does that make sense? Okay. Strong language, but he's doing that to grab your attention. He doesn't want you to settle for less than God. Okay? That's what he's getting at here. The next thing he says, he says to despise the world. Now, in the tradition, that's been frequently misunderstood too, to say we hate the word to hate the world. So sometimes you meet Christians who are terribly sour-faced, who look very unhappy, and, who's, and who have a negative view on everything that's going on. I'm reminded when I think of that of um, Thomas Merton, one of the great uh, mystics of the 20th century. And he has a, an essay in one of his books called um, Should We Love the World? And he begins the essay by saying, I'm a monk, I live in an enclosed monastery, I love beer. I have it whenever I can get it. Which for Thomas is not very often, okay? And then he says, and by that act, I love the world. Okay? Despise the world here does not mean to say that we're to look down our nose at all created things. This is God's gift. Human being, another human being is the closest you're going to get to God after the Blessed Sacrament in this lifetime. Okay? We're not to despise what God has made or created. A beautiful sunset. This is God's gift to us, you know. What he's saying when he says despise the world, the word despise there for us has an incredibly negative connotation. In its original meaning in the Latin, it says to look away from. That's what to despise means, to look away from the world. So we're not rejecting the world. 
We're not being anti-world, but we're saying look away from the world and to God. To not, in other words, allow our focus and our attention to be fixated upon the world and the things of the world, but rather to have our attention and our focus upon God. And the mysterious thing, which we're about to open up in just a moment, is that you find that you're actually given the world, the world is given back to you. Let me explain what I mean. So here's John again. I want you to look at these. These are a series of couplets. To reach satisfaction in all, desire its possession in nothing. To come to possess all, desire the possession of nothing. To arrive at being all, desire to be nothing. For to go from all to the all, you must deny yourself of all in all. Now, what most people do when they hear that passage is they only focus on the second part of each phrase. They focus on the nothing. But look what John is saying is on offer. Look at the first line. To reach satisfaction in all. Look at the third line. To come to possess all, everything. To arrive at being everything. The path is actually the path of nothingness. To possess nothing, to desire the possession of nothing, to desire even to being nothing. What's he saying? For me, the best example of this is Francis of Assisi. Francis chooses to live as radical and material and physical a poverty as he possibly can. He literally says, no possession is mine. Nothing I have is really mine. And he lives the most radical poverty the church has ever seen. But it's the same Francis who can say, that, is, that son is my brother. He experiences everything as gift because he's emptied himself of everything. I love you, still love you, God. Though I fail you, I need you so desperately.